Athens and Ecuador. Now, we're very lucky in that our company manager, Kayla, has recently returned from visiting both of these amazing destinations. Um, Kayla, if you are on, I can't see you at the moment, but if you could just do a little wave and say hello. Yeah. That would be wonderful. <laughs> there you go. Um, and so Kayla will be talking to us about her experience, um, about the programs itself, the destination, um, what it was like, her experience, and yeah, we'll have time to answer some questions at the end. Um, again, if you could just please keep yourselves on mute, that would be very helpful. Um, so again, overview of today, we'll be covering the Galapagos Island Volunteer Program, and then we'll allow some time for questions at the end that's specific to uh, the Galapagos Islands. Then Kayla will talk about her visit to the Ecuador Volunteer Program, and again, we'll have some time for questions after that. And then right at the end, we'll cover off uh, the fees that you can expect and how you can apply. Um, so without further ado, we will kick right off into it. Kayla, over to you, and let's chat about the Galapagos Islands. Cool. Thanks, Anne Shirley. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to um, come and chat with us today. Um, I'm recognizing quite a few names that I see coming through my inbox. Tracy and Jay, I can see you down there in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be able to share my experience um, on these two programs. Um, first, I spent a week in Galapagos visiting that program, and then I went over to Quito to visit that program as well. And both were pretty um, incredible experiences. So um, I'll kick it off with the Galapagos Islands. This is one of IVHQ's newest destinations that we offer. Um, and programs here range from two to 12 weeks in duration. Um, so it's obviously just based off of the um, coast of mainland Ecuador. Um, from mainland Ecuador, you're looking at about um, pretty much a full day's journey um, in the air and then over land and over sea to get there. But my goodness, once you do get there, it is well worth the journey. It is probably the most picturesque location I've ever been to. Um, you'll see some of the most incredible and rare, um, rarest animals um, you'll see in your lifetime. And the team there that's on the ground is, um, is really wonderful. Um, the program's based in a small fishing village called um, Puerto Villamil, and it's on Isabella Island, which is the, the largest of the islands. Um, and the team there, um, there's three coordinators that are there to support you. Um, there's a program director, and then there's a logistics coordinator whom a lot of you will have already been in touch with. Her name's Monique. And she um, organizes things like your transient visa and um, your ferries back and forth. So um, really strong team on the ground. Um, like I said, this is a new partnership for us. We launched in May, but they've been operating on the ground since 2006. So it's a very well-oiled machine, um, excellent support in terms of um, the local team and volunteers. And um, yeah, it was just an absolute pleasure to be able to meet them in person, uh, along with some of the volunteers on the program. So I'll first touch on um, the accommodation and the local team. So you'll see in the slide, there's a photo of one of our homestays. So in this location, um, we do work primarily with homestays. Um, those homestays can house anywhere from two up to six or eight volunteers, um, but they do like to spread volunteers out um, across. We've got about 31 families that we work with. And those families provide your breakfast and your dinner each day. And then um, your lunch um, for most of the projects is provided at a local restaurant. So you get a, a nice mixture of cultural immersion with the host families and then um, also um, the ability to try local cuisine at um, restaurants. I think we, we partner with about 15 different restaurants um, in this location. So it's a nice mix. And because the duration sort of starts from two weeks, you've got lots of time to try different um, options in town. Um, so this is just an example that you can see of um, one of the rooms in the homestay. Um, it really depends on the si size of the homestay in terms of how many people could be um, in a room with you. They do keep the rooms gender specific. Um, but usually I'd say um, this might be a bit of an anomaly, this photo, but I'd say usually volunteers 
choose to have either a single room or um, one other person in their room. If you're traveling as a family or like a larger group, we can facilitate larger um, homestays with different rooms and different size rooms. So there's lots of flexibility there. Um, but volunteers always have their own um, washroom separate from the host family. So it really is your own space to use as you wish. Um, they have a big emphasis there, obviously, on conservation and education. So in your room, you'll have um, a desk that you can do work at if you do need to work part of the time um, while you're away. The local team's office is no more than five to 10 minutes walking from all of our homestays. Um, it's a very, very small community. I'd say no more than 2,000 people. Um, so really anywhere you go, you're looking at five to 15 minutes walking and you pretty much hit the other side of the town. So it's quite easy, um, easy to get around. Um, like I said, our local team is is made up of three coordinators and, and they really are the people that you are um, touching base with on a, on a daily basis. They are, um, one of them is a local. So this is Emilio. He grew up on Isabella Island. So he knows everything there is to know about the island, what to do, um, how to get to placement, um, what the best approach is when it comes to planning for placement, what to do in your spare time, those sorts of things. Um, and then we have another coordinator who is originally from the US and um, she's been there for a year and, and they're both just such great um, mentors and, and supporters for volunteers on the program and they can be as hands-on or hands-off as as you want them to be um, but what we do suggest before you arrive is to um, download whatsapp on your phone if you don't have it because that's how the local team primarily communicates with volunteers and they will add you to um, a group chat uh, with everybody who's on the program at the same time as you so that you guys can catch up and, and meet up for, you know, spare time activities and connect for, they do a weekly meeting every Wednesday. So it really is the hub where everything starts and then, you know, you can make plans from there. Um, the meals, sorry, actually, I'm just going to go back and touch on the meals really quickly. Um, the meals are delicious. They're very carb heavy. So that is something to be prepared for. Lots of rice, pasta, plantains. Um, but um, there's also lots of fresh fish because it is a fishing village and um, there's lots of options there. Often the meals will start with um, a soup. Um, as your starter and a fresh juice, and then you'll have a main of rice, salad, plantains, and either fish, beef, or you can opt for a vegetarian meal. Um, and then usually they give you like a little dessert, like a gelato or some um, fruit, like citrus fruit or um, paya is in abundance there. So they'll usually um, finish the meal with that. Cool. So we have six really exciting projects in this destination. Um, and these projects are all designed to align with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is really cool. Um, I, when I was there, I was able to visit um, most of the projects with the exception of the sea turtle nest monitoring project, simply because um, that's a seasonal project that runs January through until the end of May. Um, but I visited sustainable agriculture. I uh, took a turn teaching English, which is definitely not my forte. <laughs> um, I visited the giant tortoise conservation project, um, environmental conservation, and then um, learned a little bit more about the conservation marketing and social media projects. So they are all based, with the exception of giant tortoise conservation, they're all based in the town. So you're looking at maybe a 10 minute commute walking um, each day. So it's not, not far at all. Um, the giant tortoise conservation project, that one is about 45 minutes to an hour outside of town. So there is some walking involved there. Um, it's very flat terrain and it's a very cool walk. Um, the, I mean, you'll probably see a wide range of native species along that route. I know when I went, it had rained that morning and one of the, um, one of the paths that we walked down was just covered in these marine iguanas and they just sort of scatter out of the way as you're walking and watch you go by and it's just such a cool um, cool experience. So yeah, that, that particular project I'd say, I um, mean, a decent level of physical fitness. Uh, the work itself is also quite um, quite taxing, um, just in terms of 
you're constantly lifting and moving and um, you know cleaning and um, and things like that. But it's it's all pretty um, pretty rewarding. Cool. All right. So there is definitely no shortage of things to do um, in your spare time. Um, what was really cool about um, this location is there's so much that you can do for free. So if you're on kind of a tight budget, there's um, I mean, there's there's a, a coastal walkway that's about seven kilometers long um, just outside of town as you enter the national park. Um, and you can rent a bike for about five to ten dollars US depending on how long you want it for. Um, and as you go down the path, there's different routes that sort of branch off and down each route is something different. So the first one is a really cool surf beach. The next one is a hiking trail. The, the next one is a trail that takes you to these mangroves and you can swim there. So there's really, really neat activities as you progress along. Um, and the coolest thing about that is you might be biking down the road or walking down the road and you turn a corner and there's just a, a giant tortoise crossing in front of you. Um, so it's the strangest experience but also one of the coolest experiences ever that that photo in the top left hand corner um i turned a corner and nearly fell off my bike because i was startled by the tortoise um but they're, they're very relaxed there is a, a rule um on any of the islands that you go to visit you have to stay at least two meters away from the animals so you're welcome to take photos but you do need to be mindful um, of their space and um the national park actually monitors what people put on social media so if they find a photo of you and you are too close to an animal they will get in touch with you to take that down and they get, they're very strict in terms of um the respect that that the animals um deserve um but i mean it's it's the animals there are, are in abundance so it's it's pretty rare that you wouldn't come across something like that which is pretty cool um there is also a really neat spot just sort of around the corner from the port where your ferry um, drops you off um where um you can go it's like a lagoon of sorts and you can go if you have a mask and fins and just do some snorkeling and there will be sea lions and um tortoise or turtles and penguins and and they'll all be sort of swimming alongside you it's very safe and they're used to um sort of the human interaction so that's a really cool free time activity and then of course because tourism is such um it's basically the main stream of income for anybody in galapagos who is is native to there um, there are lots of tours and options available um, to book into and we we don't offer um, add-ons on this particular program simply because the community is so small and um, if we were showing favoritism towards one um, tour company and not another that would create some issues within the community but what the local will do is um, after your orientation, they'll take you on a city tour, a walking tour, and they'll point out, um, you know, this place is really good for overland or onland um, um, tours. This place is really good if you want to go out snorkeling or diving. So they'll definitely point you in the right direction there. Um, but yeah, certainly no shortage of, of things to fill your weeks with. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kayla. Galapagos mm -hmm. sounds ideal. Um, do you have a sort of favorite experience um, during your time there, or is it a little too hard to specify? Oh, there were so many wonderful moments. Um, I, I really enjoyed, I mean, I know it's a full day of travel to get there, but I really enjoyed the journey over. I was sort of expecting it to be a lot harder than it was, um, but pretty much everybody's going in the same direction. So it's quite hard to get lost along the way. And um, people there are just so lovely and, and welcoming that if you do have a question, um, you know, that they'll always be happy to help. Um, I, I think one of my pinch me moments was definitely when I visited the giant tortoise conservation project and I got to feed a 170 year old tortoise, um, which was just, so I, there was that end of the spectrum, and then I also fed a one-week-old tortoise. So it was, it was pretty, pretty spectacular. Um, but yeah, just in general, I mean, I was so sad to leave. <laughs> I was so sad to leave at the end of the week, and I definitely want to go back. Oh no, that sounds um, absolutely amazing. In the contrast, <laughs> crazy. Um, so we do have we've had some questions that came through when um, 
people signed up for the program. So I might just go through a couple of these and then we'll sort of go on to our next destination. Um, now, somebody, a lot of people have been asking sort of about the weather. Now, what kind of weather can we sort of expect? Is it sort of normal season? Is it wet and dry season? You know, maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I'd say the first quarter to half of the year is technically the hot, wet season. Um, but it's a, it's an island, right? So you're probably going to experience a multitude of weather in one day. So when I was there, it would always rain first thing in the morning. And within two hours, the skies would clear so, and it would be sunny for the rest of the day. And I think that's quite common year round. Um, Cool season is supposedly September through December, but um, I was there in September and it was close to 30 degrees Celsius. So it was pretty stinking hot. So my suggestion would definitely be to bring lots of quick dry clothing, bathing suits. I mean, the beach is five, 10 minutes away. And I think I was in the water at least three times a day um, sort of thing to cool down. Um, but yeah, I'd say it's on the hotter side pretty much year round. Okay, and so following on from that, uh, a few people sort of asked about, uh, I guess, packing tips and sort of clothing recommendations. So uh, based on the fact that you say it's pretty hot, I would say, what, lighter clothing but still covered? Yeah, and I, I would say, for, especially for placements, a lot of the placements require um, longer sleeves and pants. So lightweight um, clothing, quick dry clothing is really good. In your spare time, you're welcome to wear what you want. I mean, I saw people walking down the road in bathing suits. Like it's it's a pretty casual town. Um, one thing I would say to bring lots of, especially if you're going long term, is sunscreen and after sun care. Um, the sun is so strong there, and for me, it only took one um, burn to, to learn my lesson. Um, but the reason I say bring lots is because while they do have it available in some pharmacies on the island, um, it is so expensive because they can't get it like a steady supply. So um, I think I saw like a small sunscreen for about $40 US. Like it was, it was pretty outrageous. So definitely bring lots of that if you're doing um, a project like sustainable agriculture, bring bug spray because you are going to be in in the woods, um, up in the highlands. Up in the highlands, it does get a little bit cooler. So for those volunteers, I'd say layered clothing is really good. Um, but for most of the outdoor projects, long sleeves are strongly recommended and mandatory for things like giant, giant turtle conservation. So um, yeah, definitely bring for those outdoorsy projects um, clothing you don't mind leaving behind or throwing out at the end of your trip because you will get dirty and um, the dirt there is really hard to get out. It's like a, it's almost like a clay, like a red clay sort of dirt. Um, so it's really, really hard to wash out. Okay, that, that's completely fair enough. Um, so we've got a few people actually asking some questions in the chat, which is fabulous. So I might just touch on some of these. Um, actually, uh, Ken's asked about uh, language. So what language is spoken and how easy it is to commun communicate? Because that was also a question that came through uh, earlier in the comments. Yeah, so Spanish is primarily spoken here. Um, the local team obviously speak both Spanish and English. Um, but I would say 98% of the placement staff do not speak English. So um, you don't need to know Spanish to join most of our projects. The um, environmental conservation project that is mandatory because the park rangers that you're working with, they don't speak English. Um, but everything else you can get by with minimal Spanish. You just have to get a little bit creative in terms of your facial expressions and your gestures. And um, the local team is always there to provide support in terms of translation if you need to. But um, I'd say like for teaching English as an example, um, the teachers there are English teachers, but their English is very, very broken. And that's why volunteers are so important on that project because um, they're kind of teaching children like bad English <laughs> essentially. And so our volunteers are able to sort of point them in the right direction and provide that support. Um, you definitely need to be creative 
patient on that project because the kids are often quite young and um, because they don't understand the language, um, they can get really easily distracted. So, you know, um, that's one piece of feedback that I get from some volunteers is just, you know, that that level of creativity to keep their attention on you is, is really important. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't speak Spanish. I speak very basic words and phrases. Um, and I did just fine, like it wasn't an issue. Um, but I feel like because I was so immersed in it, it actually forced me to learn more Spanish on the job um, than I would have had I not gone there, which was a really cool experience. And I came home wanting to learn um, more Spanish. So that was a really cool outcome. I completely understand that same boat here. Um, uh, actually, Mark has asked a few follow-up questions in terms of the teaching projects. So um, if you could just maybe expand on sort of like the age range roughly that you'd be helping with and like class sizes. Um, yeah. And then is it just sort of, you know, basic grammar or, you know, one like one, two, three letters, you know, what sort of teaching? Um, yeah, so there's three schools that we work with. Um, one is a primary school. So for those schools, it would be very basic words and phrases, um, often using like songs and um, like activity books, things like that. Um, then there's another school that you sort of graduate to, obviously. And then there's a high school that we also partner with. So what may end up happening um, is that you're not necessarily going to be at one school the entire time that you're there. They will often chop and change. And and, um, you know, you might Monday, Tuesday be at the junior school, Wednesday, Thursday, you might be at the senior school, Friday, you might be at the local team's office doing tutorial sessions. Um, so it really, um, we do ask that volunteers remain a little bit flexible in that sense. Um, but yeah, it, it can range probably from age, I think I taught a little girl who was maybe four or five up to, um, obviously 17 or 18. And then sometimes the local team runs um, sort of tutoring classes for adults after hours. Um, so that's something volunteers can get involved into if they want. Cool. Um, okay, and so somebody's also asked around uh, phone companies and SIM cards. So is there sort of one on the island? Is there one that's recommended? What's the sort of best way to stay in touch with everybody and you know, keep in contact? Yeah, so this is a really important one um, because you can't purchase a SIM card once you get to Galapagos. Um, those SIM cards that are available in Galapagos on any of the islands are reserved for citizens only. So you need to either prearrange some sort of phone roaming plan with your provider at home, or um, I know I, I flew through Quito personally, and there is a a mobile phone um, company that's just in the building next to the airport um, where the food court is. And I was able to get a SIM card there, but you would have to be traveling obviously when their um, office hours are essentially. And I think, I think I got mine around 7.30 in the morning. So that would probably be between seven and 7.30 is when they'd open. Um, and most of the volunteers would be flying um, through at that time anyways, so it shouldn't be an issue, but definitely you need to sort it before you leave mainland, otherwise um, there's there's no options for you on the island. But that being said, the local team's office has really great Wi-Fi, so if you do need to connect with your family or you need to do some work while you're abroad, um, you're welcome to use their office anytime. I think their hours are about 8.30 until 5.30 each day, including weekends, so definitely doable. Awesome. Um, we, well, just there's one more question I will ask, and then we'll just go on to Ecuador, and then maybe we'll have some more time at the end for some further questions. Um, so someone's asked about, you know, what if they become um, sick, and um, are there any sort of prerequisites in terms of vaccines or medicines that you know, should take before arriving? Cool. Um, so there is a hospital on the island about again, five, 10 minutes walking from your homestay. So if you do get sick, um, you just need to let the local team know and they'll make sure that you get um, medical treatment. Um, if it's something that's a little bit more serious that requires like 
for example, surgery of some sort, um, we do require that you have um, evacuation insurance as part of your travel insurance. So you would essentially be evacuated from that island to um, mainland Ecuador. Um, but for the most part, the clinic that is um, in town is sufficient for anything our team has ever encountered. It's always been minor illnesses in terms of like your tummy's just not being used to the food or, you know, those sorts of things. Dehydration is really common. Um, so they can take care of those things, no problem. The local team's also um, fully trained in first aid, so they can help with minor um, instances like that. And there's first aid in every homestay, at every placement. So yeah, there's, there's lots of options there. Awesome. Um, okay, thank you for that, Kayla. We'll sort of move on to um, Quito, Ecuador, um, and then again, some questions at the end, and then we'll just sort of see how we go. So it's great. Cool. So this was my second week in um, Ecuador. I visited Quito, um, and we've been in partnership with our team in Quito since 2008. So it's a very long um, standing partnership. Um, the team there um, established their organization in 1997, um, and all of our placements are based in South Quito. Um, our accommodation is kind of in central Quito on the South Quito border. Um, so to get to placement, you're looking at public transportation. There's a few placements, like a, um, a couple music placements and a kindergarten placement or child care placement rather, um, that is within walking distance. But for the most part, the rest of our placements do require the use of public transportation. Um, the program base, um, which is where our local team is based and the volunteer house is based, um, is about one hour to an hour and a half, depending on traffic from the airport. Um, and yeah, all of our placement work is done, like I said, in South Quito, which is the lowest income area um, of, of Quito. Um, so this is our, this is our local team up in the top corner. Um, Byron and Monica, they run our local team and are just the most wonderful humans I think I've ever met. Um, this is a photo of me with them and their three daughters. I went to their home for dinner one night and they taught me how to salsa and they taught me how to cook traditional Ecuadorian meals and um, it was a really lovely time, but they really do treat volunteers as if they're family. Um, so they're incredibly supportive. Um, this is the view from the main volunteer um, house in, in Quito. Um, all of the homes are sort of tall buildings. Um, our volunteer house is four floors with the local team's office being on the first floor, which is really convenient for volunteers. Um, and then the bedrooms, you're looking at usually two to four volunteers per room, usually single beds and bunk beds. Um, and then, um, yeah, washrooms that are shared um, in, in the house. The local team currently provides breakfast and dinner and volunteers purchase their lunch um, out in the community and the local team will point out as part of orientation where you um, where their recommended restaurants are um, and they also um, there's a mall a shopping mall just about five ten minutes around the corner and that's where sort of orientation ends because there's lots of um, restaurants in that mall there are um, places you can get sim cards there are laundry mats along the way that's where all of the banks are so they will do like a a, a simple city tour for the local area as part of that orientation. Um, but they're amazing. They they just do such wonderful, impactful work in the community. And we're really proud to, uh, to partner with them. One other thing I will say is if um, you're not keen on uh, the volunteer house, um, there are homestays available, so you can request those, um, but you'd obviously not be with the rest of the volunteers in, in most cases, um, but that is an option for volunteers. Um, in this location, we offer 10 projects. Um, it's a wide range of projects. A lot of our projects, um, like teaching and, and childcare, they often will um, shut down over the school holidays. So we have alternative school break programs during that time. Um, and I saw most of the projects when I was there. Um, my favorites being the Street Children Work Project and our Shelter Support Project. Um, 
but all of the projects were absolutely incredible. The local team focuses quite heavily on social development and providing educational opportunities through the work that they do. Um, so that's um, that's a really sort of impactful um, piece of the community, and they're very well respected um, in the community. So it's really important that volunteers, you know, abide by the program rules because it does sort of come back to the local team um, if things were to go wrong but um for the most part like our our volunteers have such positive things to say about these projects in terms of the, the direct impact they're seeing even if they're short-term volunteers um and that was really evident when i visited there was a, a two-week volunteer his name was sean and um, he was on the street children project work and he would come home every day and just like you could tell there was so much emotion in the work that he was doing and he just felt such a connection to these kids um so yeah it's it's pretty profound in terms of the impact both on the community and the volunteers um i will say across all of these projects there's a pretty significant language barrier again so knowing a basic um, level of spanish or or higher is is really important but Again, you can get by um, with gestures, and um, some of the teachers have, you know, broken English that that can be quite helpful. Um, I know the shelter support project. One of the coordinators that um, volunteers meet once they get to the placement, they do speak English, so that's really helpful. Um, but yeah, I, I would definitely brush up on your Spanish to sort of aid in that that experience because that can. Um, especially for younger volunteers that can be quite confronting. Um, so just something to keep in mind in terms of allowing that time to prepare. Cool. Um, so um, on this particular program, placements usually run Tuesday through Friday. Um, the weekends run Saturday to Monday. Um, there are two projects that you can do work um, on Monday, and that's street children work um, because the markets are always open and um, shelter support. Um, there is potential to do some NGO support work, but it just depends on the needs at that time. But the, that's one of the great things about this program is it does afford you a longer weekend to maybe travel a little bit further afield. So you can go, uh, lots of volunteers go to Banos for the weekend. Um, a lot of volunteers go to the coast. So they'll go to Santa Elena for the weekend. Um, there's the opportunity to go into the jungle and um, uh, as part of the orientation, the local team goes over all of those options with you. And if there's something you're interested in, um, they've got um, a variety of booklets and brochures that they um, put out for volunteers. So you can definitely have a look at that and they can help you to book those. And they do have certain providers um, that they would certainly recommend over others, um, primarily because those providers have liability insurance um, in case something goes wrong. Not that anything goes wrong, but just, you know, in case. Um, so definitely touch base with the local team if you are thinking of, of booking something and, and run it past them beforehand and they'll be able to help you. Amazing. Uh, so talk a little bit of Q&A um, with the keto program. Um, yeah, we do have some in the chat, so I'll start with those. Um, so somebody's asked if there's an F if there is an opportunity to learn Spanish. Are there classes available? Yes, um, and they are intensive classes. Um, so they can be arranged um, before you leave. We can pop those onto your file as an add-on. Um, I think they start from 12 hours um, of, of classes and um, each week it's usually between two and three hours per day. So you'll usually do your volunteer work in the morning and then in the afternoon you'll come back after lunch and um, jump right into those language lessons. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, it's a huge cultural immersion experience at the placement. So, um, yeah, I feel like I learned so much just from doing the volunteer work, but definitely if you're interested in learning the language, um, sign up for those lessons because the, the teachers basically speak to you in Spanish and it forces you to um, sort of come out of your shell a little bit and, and not be so nervous about making a mistake. They're really, um, they're really good at encouraging mistakes so that they can correct you and you can get it right. But yeah, the, the classes are definitely intensive. Nice. Um, and is that also an option for the Galapagos? Um, not at the moment, no, but um, the local team, they are talking about 
potentially offering it. It just, it's so inconsistent in terms of who wants to do it and who doesn't. And um, for them to sort of put that in place, um, mm -hmm. they need a consistent uh, level of interest. So if that is something you're interested in, let us know and we can uh, we can talk to the local team about that. But again, the, the fact that you're living with host families, it's almost like an informal way of taking language lessons. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say um, you're definitely gonna get get your fill of, of Spanish in, in both locations. Amazing. Um, that's definitely the best way to sort of learn yeah, all right. Exactly. <laughs> um, so we've also got a question around the altitude and if there's any hint of possibility of altitude sickness and how to sort of manage that. Yeah, so I'll touch on two things in terms of sickness, one being the altitude sickness in Quito and the other being seasickness in Galapagos. Um, so um, the altitude in Quito, I think, is around 2,800 meters. Um, and I certainly felt the effects of it myself. Um, so usually it takes, on average, I'd say, three to four days for you to acclimatize to the altitude. And that's, I mean, that's not a, a general rule. Some people go to the program and they're absolutely fine. Um, it was actually a surprise to me that I, I've never experienced it before. And I've been to high altitudes, so it was it was definitely a first for me. Um, so what I'd say is just make sure you're hydrating. Don't drink coffee. Don't drink alcohol for the first few days. Um, make sure you're hydrating. Make sure you're eating consistently throughout the day. Um, take a, a nap if you need to. Um, that was the one thing that I noticed was I was sleeping really hard in that first week um, as I was getting used to it. So um, it does exist. It doesn't affect everybody, but um, just maybe talk to your doctor before you leave um, if you think you might be prone to that sort of thing. Um, I know there's also these really cool um, supplements that you can get on Amazon that are little like stickers i put one on the back of my head and one on my belly button and it like helped with the nausea um so those are really great to look into as well but definitely chat with your doctor they'll they'll be in the best position to recommend anything for you and hydrate 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 absolutely yeah. and then in terms of galapagos um Altitude sickness isn't really an issue there, but um, the ferry ride over can be because it's so, I mean, the, the weather conditions can change so quickly. So if you're prone to motion sickness, definitely getting some seasickness pills or just, again, chatting with your doctor about your options there is a really good idea. Amazing. Um, now, uh, we've had a few people sort of ask around uh, capacity and waiting lists for programs. Um, is there a sort of time of year where it's busier and you know how soon should people be looking to apply if they have specific dates in mind? Um, and is there a waiting list if it's full? Yeah, so um, I'll speak to the program separately. I'd say for keto, our busiest time is usually May through end of August, beginning of September. Um, with Galapagos Islands, it's a little bit different because the placements have capacity um, limits. So as an example, like Giant Tortoise Conservation, you can, I think it's only a maximum of five volunteers on that particular project. So those like, and Turtle Conservation, and um, like those projects tend to fill up really quickly. Um, I think, I can't remember off the top of my head if it's January or February of this year, but um, we've reached almost max capacity across those two projects. We have other projects that are available like teaching, sustainable agriculture, but um, those sort of hot ticket projects um, that are really unique um, in terms of that experience, those ones do fill very quickly. So um, I do tell volunteers just to manage their expectations a bit. Um, if this is something you really want to do at this specific time of year, um, sign up as soon as you can and secure your spot by registering. Um, it's not a push to, to sort of get that money and it's more just if you miss out, unfortunately, we don't, there's no wiggle room in terms of um, fitting somebody else onto those projects. It's more just waiting to see if someone were to cancel or, or something like that. So definitely capacity is, is, um, is something to keep in mind for Galapagos. Um, keto, I mean, capacity is, is always an, something to think about across all of our projects because 
you know, they are popular and they do fill first come first serve, there's a little bit more capacity in keto. So one thing you could do is, um, you know, start your program in keto, stay there for a few weeks and then jump over to Galapagos because they are really close. So, you know, if, if say at the end of February, you, the project you want in Galapagos is full, do two weeks in keto and then come visit us in, in March because there's lots of availability. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Um, and now I'm sure people can Google this. We've had a, quite a few questions around the weather for Keto and Ecuador as well. So we obviously covered it for Galapagos. Is it yeah. similar climate in Ecuador? Colder. Colder. Uh, yes, colder. Um, so definitely um, you want to bring layered clothing in Keto. The, the weather there is very similar year round. I mean, the, the wet season is um, usually the first half of the year, but in terms of temperature, um, you're looking at usually between anywhere from, I'd say 14 to 20 degrees Celsius. Sorry, I don't know Fahrenheit, but um, <laughs> Canadian. Um, um, yeah, 14 to 20 degrees Celsius, but like, cold in the morning gets progressively warmer during the day and then gets cold again at night and the thing to remember about ecuador is they don't have, their homes are not heated so we've got lots of blankets that will keep you warm in terms of sleeping arrangements um, but we definitely recommend layered clothing that you can just peel off throughout the day and put, put back on at night fair enough layers are always a good option yeah. to sort of change right and another thing that I learned when I, I went there was um, shorts are not common in Ecuador. So um, you can really spot a tourist <laughs> because they're, they, they often wear shorts, but it's really uncommon for Ecuadorians to wear shorts. So we do recommend pants for placement and you can wear what you want in your spare time. That's no problem, but um, it is kind of frowned upon at the placements if, if people turn up in shorts. Yeah, that's completely fair enough. Um, another popular question, it seems, is around sort of carrying cash and like budgeting for sort of the sort of odds and ends expensive, like how expensive are things there? How much would you recommend to sort of have on hand for like a week? Yeah. So uh, in keto, I would say, um, because you have to buy your own lunch, I'd budget about three to five dollars US for that. Um, in uh, in Galapagos, your meals are all included. But if you want to go out for a meal, I'd say budget between seven to twenty dollars US. And just remember, if you're going to a sit down restaurant, they do like tipping is a thing there, so you have to keep that in mind. Um, obviously, not if you're doing um, your your program meals. So um, in Galapagos, what happens is um, they give you a little ID card, and you flash your ID card when you go into the restaurant, and they'll give you um, a program menu that you can order off of for your lunches. Um, and then you don't have to do any tipping or anything like that. But if you order off the menu or decide to go out to one of the beachside bars or restaurants um, for, for a meal, which I highly recommend, they're very cool. Um, then you have to consider things like tipping with tours. Tipping is you're looking at usually about 10%. Um, so yeah, just things like that to keep in mind. So in keto, I'd say you're probably okay with about 75 to hundred dollars per week. Um, Galapagos, we recommend usually one for two weeks, we say between six and 700, just simply because um, there's two ATMs on the island, but they very rarely work. So um, definitely bringing cash is important and small denomination bills, very small bills. Um, and the currency is USD across both of those locations. Um, so small denomination bills, um and then yeah after two weeks in galapagos we usually say 150 to 200 per week but that's really only if you're going out for drinks or dinner or you're going on tours consistently um if you're not doing that then the budget can be a little bit smaller one thing in, in galapagos is um, like to get to the ferries and get off the ferries you also need small bills like one dollar bills for the water taxis because the ferry doesn't come straight to the dock so i'd say if you have i think i took about 20 dollars in ones with me when I was there just in case um, and I use probably half of them on water taxis. Mm -hmm. Good advice. Um, 
and we're going to start wrapping up, so I'll sort of have two more questions and then we'll get to the last part of this webinar. Um, we've had a lot of questions around safety. So, yeah. you know, for solo, solo travellers, solo female travellers, and just safety in general, you know, when at night or by yourself, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe sort of cover how it'll work and how much support maybe you get from the team there. Yeah, so in both locations, the team will go over a pretty in-depth safety briefing as part of orientation. Um, that's pretty much mandatory across all IVHQ programs. Um, and in terms of Quito, it is a bigger city. So, you know, like any big city, there are good neighborhoods and there are not so good neighborhoods, but they will cover all of that at orientation. Um, and as part of your walking tour, they have preferred, um, you know, taxis and Ubers that they recommend, and they'll give you all of that information. So as long as you're following their recommendations um, that they provide at orientation, you shouldn't have any issues. Um, they do have a curfew in place in Quito, um, and that's just an added safety measure. So after dark, they do not recommend you are walking the streets. So if you want to go out for dinner and it's dark out, let the local team know and they'll arrange for a taxi to come and get you um, and to pick you up again afterwards. Um, again, just as an added safety measure, because, um, you know, it is, um, it, it can be unpredictable. It just, you know, sometimes volunteers will wear jewelry or they'll flash their smartphones around in neighborhoods that they shouldn't. And that's when volunteers tend to get into trouble. But again, the local team covers all of that at orientation, the do's, don'ts, and as long as you're following that, it's fine. Um, Galapagos, it's such a safe town. Um, it's really interesting. It was interesting because the, um, the town itself, everyone in the town is on a WhatsApp group. And if something happens, everybody knows about it. And so, for example, one volunteer lost his wallet at one of the restaurants um, down by the beach. And within two hours, that wallet was back with him because the community just sort of came together and said, we found this. Who does it belong to? Who was there? And they've got security cameras and like all of this stuff. So they figured it out pretty quickly. But the the town actually comes to life at night i'd say after dark everybody's out walking around it's very safe and because it's such a small knit community um everybody's got each other's backs and everybody if something goes down on one street everybody knows about it and so everyone's on their best behavior all of the time <laughs> um of course there are no matter where you go you should be aware of your surroundings and and those sorts of things but um yeah, I mean, in terms of safety in Galapagos, I I felt safe the entire time. I traveled by myself, um, and I I had no issues. And I have yet to hear a volunteer who has had an issue because everybody's following you know, the program recommendations. I love that. That sounds like such a cool little place to be. Um, yeah. now I really wish I could have gone there. <laughs> um, okay, final question, just around sort of the types of volunteers that could be suitable for, but yeah. specifically we've had questions around, is it okay and suitable for families mm -hmm. um, or older volunteers? Yep. Um, so keto, I would say, is yep suitable for families. Um, if you're traveling solo, you do have to be 18. But if you're traveling as a family, um, yep, you can by all means come. I would recommend um, the homestay for families instead of the volunteer house, just simply because of the social environment. And I'd say in keto, the larger majority of our volunteers are between 18 and 35. Um, there's no alcohol or anything in the accommodation, so that's not something to be worried about. But they do tend to stay up a little bit later chatting and watching movies and things like that, which isn't always conducive to um, younger kids. So the homestay is a great option in keto. Um, that can be arranged at no additional charge, so that's great. Um, Galapagos, great option for families. Um, the minimum age with families is 12. Um, the local team can be a little bit lenient, but it's more so because of the project work that's involved and the stamina that's required. Um, but definitely a great option because there's so much to do in your spare time as well. And you're seeing things that you would never see at home. Um, so unique and rare in terms of animals and sites and, and whatnot. So it would be a really cool experience for a family. Amazing. Yeah. Um, and then for older volunteers, both would be 
perfectly suitable? Both are, are definitely suitable. I'd say keto, just simply because of the way the houses are structured, they're very tall, so there's lots of stairs that you have to climb. So if there's mobility issues of any kind, it could be a little bit trickier, um, whereas um, Galapagos is much flatter. Um, so, but but both are suitable. We've had volunteers into their 80s on both programs, so it's it's definitely definitely doable. Amazing. Okay, we will get on to the last part. So let's talk the fees, what's involved, um, and how much this would cost. Cool. So for our fees, IVHQ has a registration fee, um, and that basically secures your spot on the program um, and then grants you access to um, your pre-departure checklist, which has things like your training modules, your program guide, um, access to our flights and insurance partners, um, those sorts of things, and then obviously additional dedicated service um, and support from your program manager. Um, then there's the program fee, and the program fee is what we, um, it all comes through IVHQ, but we send the program fee to our local team to cover all of your in-country support. So that's things like, um, oh, Joan, that's such a nice message. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, so the program fee covers um, like your accommodation, uh, meals, uh, airport pickup, orientation, um, not airport pickup in Galapagos. It's a local pickup just because of the logistics involved, but your pickup is included. And then the 24-7 support from our local team. Um, so yeah, this is kind of a breakdown. Um, as you can see, you'll have the emergency details provided to you um, when you arrive at orientation. Um, when you do register in your program guide, you'll be able to learn more about the local team, who they are, what they do, how they can support you. Um, but pre-departure IVHQ um, will remain your primary point of contact and then they'll take over um, once you arrive in country. And obviously now that everyone's raring to go and wanting to <laughs> sign up for the Galapagos and Keto, um, how do they go about doing it? So the first step would be to submit an application on our website um, where you'll be prompted to create a user profile and that is your My IVHQ profile for life. Um, so you can submit all of your um, applications through there. Um, and then it takes us uh, usually no more than 24 hours to process that application, maybe a little bit longer over the weekend. Um, so we try and get those done as quickly as possible because we know, you know people are so super excited to get the ball rolling um, but applying is free so if you're not sure on your dates or you're um, you know you have some questions you can just submit an application we sort of see that as an expression of interest um, and then we can have conversations back and forth with you to sort of help narrow down your options um, and clarify anything um, that you you need clarification on before you secure your spot and then from there you basically pay that registration fee to secure your spot it locks you into those dates um, that you've applied for. If you do need to make changes to your dates, that's no problem. You just need to get in touch with me and I can make those adjustments for you on this end. Of course, it's pending availability, um, especially with Galapagos and, and the capacity um, stuff. So um, yeah, I, I guess we just, um, we're really excited to be able to offer both of these destinations. And having been there myself, I, I just want so badly for people to go and experience what, what I was able to experience those two weeks. So um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to get in touch and um, yeah, we can get that ball rolling. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kayla. Mm -hmm. um, I think Joan said it best in the chat. Uh, your This is so informative and your enthusiasm is palpable, which I absolutely love and 100% agree with. Um, just some final sort of housekeeping um, things. If you do have any questions that we haven't answered, obviously we've run out of time, please, please send them through to info at volunteerhq.org. We have a fabulous inquiries team who can ask you questions, but if it's anything too detailed, um, they can pass it on to Kayla for you. Um, and just in terms of the, you know, making the changes, we have a great flexible booking policy, which means you can make free changes up until 14 days before your departure dates. And that includes, you know, changing the duration, the destination, um, how long the dates you're going for, all of the things. So um, yeah, we're 
we're here to make it as easy as possible for you. So thank you everyone for joining us. We really do hope this was helpful. Um, we'll be sharing the link of the recording as soon as it's available with everybody. And we hope you have a wonderful evening, afternoon or morning, wherever you're joining us from today. Come. Bye everyone, thanks for coming. See ya.